This is Local Talk Radio, 660 AM. If you love wealth better than liberty, the tranquility of servitude better than the animating contest of freedom, go from us in peace. We ask not your counsels or your arms. Crouch down and lick the hands which feed you. May your chains set lightly upon you, and may posterity forget that you were our countrymen. Samuel Adams. The time is near at hand, which must determine whether Americans are to be free men or slaves. George Washington. In what country can preserve its liberties if its rulers are not warned from time to time that this people preserve the spirit of resistance? Let them take arms. The tree of liberty must be refreshed from time to time with the blood of patriots and tyrants. Thomas Jefferson. Posterity, you will never know how much it costs the present generation to preserve your freedom. I hope you will make good use of it. If you do not, I shall repent in heaven that ever I took half the pains to preserve it. John Adams. I sincerely believe that banking establishments are more dangerous than standing armies, and that the principle of spending money to be paid by posterity under the name of funding is but swindling futurity on a large scale. Tom Jefferson. Government is instituted to protect property, this being the end of government. That alone is a just government, which impartially secures to every man whatever is his own. That is not a just government, nor is property secure under it, where arbitrary restrictions, exceptions, and monopolies deny the part of its citizens that free use of their own faculties. James Madison. It would be an absurdity for jurors to be required to accept the judge's view of the law against their own opinion, judgment, and conscience. John Adams. Whenever the legislators endeavored to take away and destroy the property of the people or to reduce them to slavery under arbitrary power, they put themselves into a state of war with the people who are thereupon absolved from any further obedience and are left to the common refuge which God hath provided for all men against force and violence. John Locke. It is in vain, sir, to extenuate the matter. Gentlemen may cry, peace, peace, but there is no peace. The war is actually begun. The next gale that sweeps from the north will bring to our ears the clash of resounding arms. Our brethren are already in the field. Why stand we here, idle? What is it that gentlemen wish? What would they have? Is life so dear or peace so sweet as to be purchased at the price of chains and slavery? Forbid it, almighty God. I know not what course others may take, but for me, give me liberty or give me death. Patrick Henry. My people perish for the lack of knowledge. God. Yep, you're on. Hello? You there? Yeah. Yeah, he's on. Yep, I'm here. You're on. Yeah, I'm here. All right. Excellent. Thank you. Sorry sorry he's about on. the break there. <laughs> the timing was just not the best. Anyways, we have Stefan Kinsella on with us uh, right now, and one of, I believe, the leading thinkers, writers in the libertarian anarchist, private society, you name it, this is the guy to go to. Anyway, Stefan, we've been talking about private society versus what we have today and um, or base and mostly, you know, the law enforcement. And that's that's what everyone's the biggest hang up, I guess, that we get from other people is, well, how would we be protected? You know, we just have roaming gangs. Everyone would be running around with their M16s killing everyone, which I don't think that's the case. But could you go back and discuss some of that with us? Yeah, sure. Um, and I think that is, in a way, the most honest and sincere um, opposition to the free market case, right, is the idea that without some kind of centralized uh, protection of rights, you're going to have uh, chaos or anarchy, as they call it. So this is one of these cases where I think we should be clear on our terms. So, for example, um, in recent years, I have I have, I have my, myself have adopted the uh, the uh, the approach of like calling public school I don't call it public schooling I call it government government school <laughs> because I want to emphasize that it's not 
I mean, public is an ambiguous vague word. It means open to the public, right? Which any restaurant is public in that sense, which is how the government justifies regulating them under civil rights laws and affirmative action laws and anti-discrimination laws, et cetera, civil rights acts, et cetera. So I think we should be clear in our terms. So I'm always careful to distinguish government from state. The state is an institution that has certain features or characteristics, the power to tax, the power to outlaw competing, competing agencies. And, the, and government is an ambiguous term, which could mean just the governing institutions of society, law, justice, order, or it could mean the state. And if you think the state is the only way to provide these things, you're going you're gonna to equate them. Sort of like how people nowadays think of roads and defense as essential features of the government or the state, right? Mm-hmm. But really, a road doesn't have to be provided by the, by the state. So I think we should distinguish these things. So the question is, what is important to us as human beings, which includes government, right, which, which means regularity, order, rules, law, justice, does it have to be provided by a monopolistic institution called the state? So that's the main question, and I think that you can't – that 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 has not been shown by the advocates of the state. In fact, the state – perverts and corrupts government and justice. Um, for example, nowadays, everyone thinks of law as whatever the government says the law is. Okay? Yep. Whereas in ancient times, law was thought to be sort of a codification, a systematized way of understanding what our rights are, what right and wrong are, what justice is. So, in other words, if you ever get into a difficult dispute about what the law should be, then you would always answer it by saying, let's step back and let's talk about what justice is. What's the just result? What's the right result? But in today's situation, the gov- the state has dominated the definition of law. And so the question is always, what do those words mean? What did the government write? What did the Congress legislate. And so the question is not what's just anymore. The question is what is what's the meaning of words? So if if the government passes a law saying all Jews should be rounded up and sent to concentration camps, then the only question is what does it mean to be a Jew? Or what does it mean to be rounded up? Right? So in other words, the connection between what the law means and what justice is is totally lost if you focus on this legislated idea of law, which comes from identifying government with the state. So I am always careful to say government and justice and right and wrong are not the same thing as what the state is about. The state is about total control and about domination of our lives. So don't confuse the state and order and law and justice and government with the state. Right, because there's nothing wrong with governance itself. I mean, we should all self-govern. We should all be self-governing. doesn't mean that we should be have monopoly on violence in that area. And one of the, one of the things that I think, one of the biggest flaws, I think, that the uh, United <laughs> States Constitution was – that it gave Congress the right to create law, which is exactly where where we are now because of what you said that the state's done with it. Yes, absolutely. Although I think that that mistake was a minor mistake in the sense that even if the federal government, which they created, which they created to have limited powers, which is a new type of government in the history of the world, um, even if you let them slide into having general legislative powers, then they're just like every other state, like Louisiana or Texas or Pennsylvania or Massachusetts or New York or Rhode Island or, you know, whatever. All these states or France, you know, or Spain, all these states are considered to have what's called general or plenary police or legislative powers. In other words, 
up until the U.S. government, every state was considered to have a full sovereignty, that is, the right to enact whatever law they wanted, unless there was some prohibition on it. Okay, and that's what a Bill of Rights is in the U.S. scheme. It, so the idea is the government has wide powers, but we're going to limit that with a Bill of Rights or a, or a written constitution, which is what most of the 50 states have. The federal government had two or, or three or more layers of protection. Number one, the federal government um, had a Bill of Rights, limited what they could do, but it also – had a limited grant of powers. They were not supposed to have a general or plenary police or legislative power like most normal states do because of Article One, Section 8 of the Constitution and the Amendment Number 10, which explains that the federal government only has whatever powers are granted to it explicitly in the Constitution and no other powers. So in that respect, the American... It's kind of a contradiction because the American government, the American state, the United States federal government is unique in the world in that it is both the most powerful state that has ever existed, despite the fact that it has limits placed upon it in its constitution, which limits it more than most other states have ever been in, in human history. <laughs> um, so it's, it's sort of like a bizarre walking contradiction in terms. That, uh, yeah, <laughs> there's no doubt about that. It's amazing, which shows that a piece of paper can't control a state, really. So how do we get – Let's. I'm of the opinion myself that, that uh, there is a pending economic collapse or whatever, and, and it's going to be interesting to see what comes out on the other side. But, you know, back to, to this uh, – private law society, how how could that work with the uh, – in the protection industry part of it? Because I, I think that is the – and like you said, it's probably the most honest question. And even Ron Paul, when he was on Tom Wood's show, when Tom asked him, are you an anarcho-capitalist, flat out? And, and Dr. Paul said, well, I have one problem, and that is the protection side. Right, right. So I have um, – personally, I have different ways of approaching that, that sort of question. Um, the first question is, what are we asking about? Are we asking whether the United States government or any other kind of government is legitimate? Or are we asking for a prediction about what would society look like in a free society? Um, and prediction is a perilous activity. Um, but I do think that I think I think that we I think that we can predict a few things. We can predict that there if there's a demand for a service, then we can expect that it will be provided on the free market. And there's clearly clearly a demand for uh, protection of property, for outsourcing of um, defense functions, etc. Um, there's also a role for private defense, you know, people being armed so they can defend themselves in the moment if some kind of crime occurs. Um, most of the persuasive writers I have read on this topic, including uh, David Friedman, Bob Murphy, Hans Hermann Hoppe, and others uh, from older days, argue that what you could expect to see – now, again, this is a prediction – but what you could expect to see is that the state recedes. Well, number one, crime would crime would become uh, uh, much more minimized. There would be less crime because the only way to achieve a private law society that most people are coming to believe and agree with the uh, the libertarian perspective on private property rights. So these people are not, by and large, going to be committing crimes. It's going to be a minority of, of people. And if we, as we have a richer society with more technological progress and more economic progress, there's a, a reduced need in the first place for people to become criminals because it's e just easier to make money in a legitimate way. So I think that we can expect that crime would be a more minimalized problem and would be handled by specialists or just handled by insurance. So. The insurance idea is that insurance companies would be insuring the value of your current property, and they would be patrolling or 
having some kind of arrangements with each other or with private patrols to try to reduce the likelihood of a insurable incident, which is a type of crime. And they would insure you in the case of your a theft, and they would try to prosecute and the theft or find the the malfeasor who committed the tort of a theft and punish or have a trial or banish them or whatever. So the problem seems to be not that insurmountable. I think the big problem that we encounter is threats by other states. Like, let's say America somehow became anarchist tomorrow. Well, Russia and China still have nuclear weapons and they they could invade. And we have no government to defend to defend us from Russia. <laughs> so I think that the perspective would be several fold. Number one, um, do we really think that the United States government has done a good job in defending us from threats over the last, say, say five decades? Um, or have they stirred things up and made Americans more vulnerable to attack? Um, and I think the latter is obviously the case. Quite obvious, so, yes. <laughs> so even if you spend a trillion dollars a year on the world's most expensive military, which, by the way, of course, not every country has the option of being the number one military on the earth. So it's American, the American perspective is not something that you can generalize to a libertarian audience because not everyone lives in, in America. Okay, so if you live in Chile or Bolivia or South Africa or Taiwan or Korea, South Korea, you, you can't just take the American line that, well, we should just have the strongest military and dissuade all you know, dissuade all attackers. Because everyone can't have the strongest military. So they can't be a generalizable libertarian position. Um, so I would say that the U.S. military has just impoverished us, has, has stoked up dangers, has made us less reliable, less secure. So comparing a state of private law to what we have now is not a good comparison because the modern state fails because we're paying trillions of dollars and we're getting less secure because of it. <laughs> so that's the real world comparison. So instead of conjuring up boogeymen of um, having a free society that's, in, that's threatened by another state, why don't we conjure up today's situation, which is – an American state-dominated society threatened by other states because we have stoked up the threat. Um, the other thing I would say is that if you could imagine ever achieving a world of freedom, it would have to be because some technologically advanced society like the U.S. gradually moves towards that situation. And if we ever did that, then, then the, the real threat would be as if Cuba was threatening Texas, okay, or Cuba threatening the U.S. You have some backwater communist enclave, which is technologically, economically, socially, and culturally backwards and repressed and poor, and uh, technologically backwards, threatening an advanced society. So I think in the real world, uh, a free a free, if you can imagine America becoming free and anarchist, the threat by these small communist enclaves is negligible and uh, trivial because we would just dominate them with resources and with defenses and with uh, um, and with our ability to um, to fight them off. So I don't think that's a real uh, problem either. Is, Are you funded? It, Go ahead. I was just going to say, as part of the problem where people would see that is just because they don't take, they don't see what a free market would do. They see this, you know, they can't erase the state out of the picture because that's what we're talking about is a total free market and the advancements without the re regulation restrictions of the state, freedom and technology, all those things would just explode. Wealth, the the whole thing, the free market would be unhindered and would be a good thing for society rather than what the state tells us a bad thing. And I think, yeah, I think, I think that's I, what I think people have a hard true. time seeing is 
is taking the state out of it and how much better that would be and that would answer a lot of the questions like what you just said. Yeah, well, it's, it's, I think it's not only that. It's also that the, uh, uh, let's say the United States became a, a private law society. Well, there's no one for a foreign regime to threaten and to conquer because it's decentral, It's decentralized. I mean, it's not just Pennsylvania and uh, New York and Massachusetts and Delaware and Texas and Wyoming, whatever. It's not just state. It's just every local community is separate and independent. So there's no way to conquer the country because, because, because let's say the, the Chinese or the Russians land in, 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 uh, in Plymouth and they conquer that little local region. They can't just issue a decree from the central government and say we've taken over the government that controls the whole country because there there is no control of the whole country because it's, it's like a separate – it's a separate decentralized land. Um, so the, the, the very idea of conquering a country that's decentralized makes less sense when you have anarchy because there's no one to conquer. There's no one to – to win over, there's no one that can emit a central command. Okay, we've been defeated. Everyone, lay down your arms. It just wouldn't happen. You would have uh, 90, 95 percent of the country still fighting for their own independence and freedom. And so, I think that a decentralized anarchist private property land is less of a target for any possible invader army because. They just can't defeat it by taking over the head because there's no head. There's no capita, you know? They would literally have to defeat the entire landmass. Yes, and, 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 and as I said, I think we can expect that any private society like this is going to be much more wealthy and well-armed um, than any kind of a two-bit country that might want to attack us. So the the entire idea is just uh, remotely uh, ridiculous. Yes, China or Russia could nuke us tomorrow. I guess we could get nuked, but well, I don't know what that's going to get them. If they just destroy part of the country, well, they could they could they could cause destruction, which is part of the problem with weapons and nuclear weapons and weapons of mass destruction and states themselves, because no private no private group would ever. Um, Use uh, weapons of mass destruction in that in that fashion. <laughs> no, you're absolutely right. Of course they would, because I mean, their whole point would be to it would be as the creation of wealth. And if your objective is not to rule over someone, why would you nuke them? And I think you get yeah. the point. Why would Russia? Why would they nuke us for? Or I mean, not us. Why would they just nuke? Just for the heck of it, they can't. You can't control it because you destroy the area. There's no way to take the resource because you just contaminated it. Hmm. I hadn't quite thought that one over. Interesting. Yeah, you're talking about this, Claudio Gomes. Uh, you're talking about this another day with a friend. He he said the exact same thing. If a military disappear, it will be safer because there's no not a head to be cut off of the system. People never surrender because uh, there's no leadership to to control. So every individual will be a resistance. Right. Yeah. I mean, look, we have about what 200, 180 countries in the world today. Um, imagine a world where we multiply that by ten or a hundred. So imagine there's. Instead of 200, there's 2,000 countries, or maybe 20,000 countries, or maybe 200,000 countries, or 2 million countries. So if you imagine the number of distinct autonomous regions that exist, and of course, by the way, the ultimate ideal for the libertarians would be 7 billion regions, right? In other words, every every individual is a sovereign. So that's the ultimate ideal. Um, goal, and that's why decentralization tends to be um, in the favor of liberty and libertarianism, because if we go from 200 states to 2,000, then we're moving in the direction that we want, which is 7 billion different states, uh, in effect. But imagine you have 2,000 states instead of 200. Um, It would be increasingly impossible 
for any any state to become very large and belligerent and for them to do anything. I mean, what are they going to do? Take over one country, which is one two thousandth of the world economy? Or are they going to take over 100 countries? How are they going to do that? So the more states you have, the more decentralization you have, I think the better, the better off we are, and the more helpless that aggressive bellicose state um, would be. Well, and, in, and you look at the, what wars are fought over. It's um, World War One was a good example of it. it. wasn't The people had no interest in killing each other. It was states, right? Heads of states causing a war. And if you don't have those heads of state, that it's just like right now with the insanity going on in Ukraine, where Obama and Kerry and McCain and those just boggles my mind the stuff that they say, and. Oh, it would be wonderful if they didn't exist, but they do. But, I mean, they – I don't know anyone that wants to have a war because of Ukraine, but these tyrants are threatening, basically, war because they have a head to pick on, which is Putin. So the heads of these two states are pushing back and forth, back and forth, and if they didn't exist, no one would care what's going on in Ukraine right now anyways, but – yeah, I think that's true. It, it, it also explains why libertarians like uh, Cato people and others, um, their focus is on like what Obama should do or what John Kerry, as head of uh, Secretary of State, should do. Mm-hmm. So they know that the main actors on the world stage nowadays are these 200 states dominated by the U.S. and the West, right? And so that's their main focus. What should America's position be? What should Obama do? And so their entire libertarian energy is, uh, is, is, is is directed at trying to argue what the state should do. Now, to my mind, as an anarchist, private property, society, libertarian, I view this as almost like focusing on what the mafia's policy should be in a given neighborhood. It's like, well, given that the mafia runs a neighborhood or a region of New York or whatever, or New Jersey – what what should the mafia's policy be? I mean, g- given that the mafia has control and they're going to extort local business owners, given that the mafia um, exists, given 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 that the government policy uh, exists to allow the mafia to exist, like drug laws and prostitution laws and alcohol laws and gambling laws, um, given that all these things exist. Well, we need to ask a practical question. What should the mafia's policy be? And maybe we should have uh, council discussions and sit down with mafia leaders and pretend like we're all civilized people and say, listen, I know you're in control of things. We're not going to fight about that because that would be impolite. But we think that the mafia should allow the local school districts a certain degree of freedom. We think the, ma- we think the mafia should do X, Y, and Z. Now, that would be clearly ridiculous. Um, because it makes it obvious that we're dealing with criminals and we're whitewashing criminality and immorality. But when it comes to the state, people do the same thing, even though the state is even worse than the mafia. The state is bigger, kills more people than the mafia, and has a much more extensive propaganda network, which bamboozles the public into thinking they're legitimate. At least the people know the mafia is not legitimate, and the mafia can therefore only get away with so much criminality. But the state, uh, to my mind, is a much bigger offender. So I think we shouldn't deceive ourselves. Um, If we want to work with the government, that's fine, but we shouldn't delude ourselves into thinking it's anything more than a a glorified mafia. Absolutely. Could... You've said the word libertarian a couple of times, and earlier we were talking about defining terms. And if you could, let's talk about what is what is your in your mind what is libertarianism? Because if you listen to the radio now, Sean Hannity is a libertarian, and so is Glenn Beck. Uh, might surprise people. Self-proclaimed, which is amazing to me, as they are marching, calling for war, libertarian wars, of course. But let's. If you would, let's talk about what is libertarianism versus, I mean, because I think it needs to be defined, like you brought up Cato and stuff. It, is, are those the essence of libertarianism right there at the Cato Institute? Yeah, yeah. No, so that's, that's a good question. So um, libertarian is the word we use, and words 
the way that we, we humans communicate, words are, uh, are, are, uh, are, are symbols that we use to, to denote certain concepts. Because we think conceptually, that's how we understand the world. We're intelligent, uh, conscious beings. We have a brain. We have a mind. And we understand the world in terms of concepts. That is principle, a principled way of grouping related phenomena together. That's how we understand things. Words are just l- linguistic means of, of marking these concepts. So the, the word libertarian is a type of political concept because most of us are interested in political ideas. That is, we're interested in figuring out what is the right way to use force in society. When When is it legitimate for us to use force against each other? Because violent conflict is possible, and we know that most of us want to avoid that. So we think to ourselves, well, what rules should we all agree to that make sense that regulate these affairs in human in human uh, interrelationships? So different political theories or political philosophies have different answers to these questions. So you have socialism, you have liberalism, you have um, welfare statism, you have conservatism, you have theocracies, and you have different philosophies which have different answers to this question. So this question is a perennial one of human nature, human society. It's been around for thousands of years. The libertarian approach is just one of these answers, but it's, it's unique, I would argue, in that it answers the question in a unique way. And it answers it in a way that makes every other competing philosophy seem similar to each other in the relevant respects. And that is that we say that when we have a dispute, we settle it by a consistent principled application of the idea that we all want peace, cooperation, and prosperity in our own lives and with each other. We all want to be able to trade with each other, to cooperate with each other. We all want to be able to use scarce resources in the world which is things like you know land and cars and metal and steel and other things. We want to be able to use these things, but if we're fighting over them, we're not going to be able to use them productively and peacefully. So everyone has an interest in, in adopting a certain set of rules, which we call property rights, which allows us to do that. And pretty much every social philosophy, every political philosophy has an answer to that question. Only the libertarians have an answer, to my mind, that is consistent and has integrity and is uh, and um, and uh, doesn't contradict itself. So our answer is: Listen, if you see a particular scarce resource that people can fight over, we have to answer the question: Who gets to use it? And so far, everyone agrees with us. Our answer is: Whoever found the resource first started using it first or sold it, or, or, or you acquired this resource by a contract from that kind of person, that, that is the owner. That's how we find out who the owner should be. And that is the common sense answer of almost every society and culture in human history, every, every normal person. But if you try to apply that consistently, that's where libertarianism arises, and that's where we split from other political philosophies, because... Every other philosophy deviates from that answer at some point, and they end up saying, okay, we see a scarce resource that people can fight over, like a a house or even your body. And the libertarian answer is that the person himself is the owner or the guy that first acquired it or who acquired it by contract. That's our answer. It's very simple. They want to say, well, in this case, we're going to make an exception. We're going to say that normally white people own themselves, but black people in 1825 in America, well, they're owned by whoever brought them over on a boat, whoever they were sold to. Right? That's slavery, chattel slavery, chattel slavery. Okay, So they make an exception to the regular Lockean rule of contract and ownership. <laughs> or they will say that normally if you are paid $10,000 to – do a legal deal for someone as part of your private law practice, you own that $10,000 because the owner of the money owned it and gave it to you voluntarily, so they transferred ownership to you. But under a system of taxation, 
75%, whatever the, the, the ongoing tax rate is, a certain percentage of that of that revenue, that gain, gets transferred to the government, to the state. And then the state uh, takes a, their, their handling fee, which is usually half or one-third, and they redistribute the rest to the poor or to military defense contractors who are bombing innocent Iraqis or whatever. So the point is, it's a resting W-R-E-S-T, or resting, a taking of property from people and giving it to other people. It's a, it's a type of theft. In the name of property rights, in the name of democracy. So I would say that the only way to approach things systematically and with principles is to respect property rights, respect first ownership, respect contract. But if you deviate from that, you're basically in favor of either slavery, partial or complete, or theft, partial or complete. And every systematic way of looking at society that is not libertarian, in effect, ends up endorsing some kind of institutionalized, widespread, systematic slavery, extortion, or theft. <laughs> and that is a fundamental problem with every system that is not libertarian. So the reason to be libertarian is that you are against slavery and theft, if I could put it uh, in concise form. Which is, um, you're right, we, um, I think most of the people that listen to this show would probably consider themselves conservatives. And conservatism, at least modern conservatism, has shown that they have no problem with theft or the initiation, the initiation of violence and wars, which that's, that's an essence of libertarian too, isn't it? The uh, non-initiation of aggression outside of well, self-defense? Absolutely. I, I, I would be careful about uh, equating conservatism with republicanism, True. although Good uh, point. <laughs> they, have, they have equated themselves, and so it's sort of their fault. Um, Republicans are basically unredeemable, in my view. Um, the Republican Party and the modern conservative movement, um, as far as I can see, is, an, is, a, is a bizarre, incoherent, unprincipled alliance between three groups which have very little in common. Number one, you have the um, you have the uh, you have the the the, 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 uh, the neocons, like the uh, the former communist, anti-communist. Commie sympathizers who are pro war, you know, the Bill Crystal, et cetera, Irving Crystal, so the neocon. Number two, you have the uh, moral majority conservative types, um, the, the Jerry Falwell types, the Joe Sixpack types, the union worker types, which are basically in favor of conservative traditional family values combined with Christian morality. Basically, they're, they're the theocrats. Okay. And then you have the third party would be the Chamber of Commerce free market type, which I think is the best part of the Republican the conservative movement. Um, they're a little bit unprincipled on matters outside of Chamber of Commerce free market type issues, but they're basically decent in their mentality. Um, and if the Republican Party could just be them, it would be much better off. But they all align together for some bizarre reason. Now, the Democrats, um, or more coherent, possibly, in my view. They're basically socialism light. Um, they're more evil in the sense that they are more dedicated towards destroying institutions that, um, that support human liberty and human flourishing. In other words, the, the liberals and the Democrats um, have a more coherent message, but it's, it's more evil because it's more, co it's more obviously. Uh, dedicated towards destroying human value. Um, so, for example, the liberals will support a policy under ostensible grounds of increasing human uh, flourishing or prosperity or diversity or whatever, and then, when their, and then when their means fail to achieve the results that they claimed it would achieve, 
for example, under socialism or under the uh, the welfare state, which have been massive failures. Um, instead of admitting that they were wrong, they will change the goalposts. They will say, well, we used to be in favor of economic prosperity, but now we're in favor of um, a meaningful life lived in an egalitarian society or something like that. So they will just change the goalposts. So in a way, they're more insidious and evil and dishonest than the right because they they sort of have a more coherent philosophy and they know they know at this point that their 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 uh, their policies have been massive failures and they really don't care because I think they're basically they're basically lying about what they're really in favor of or they change their they change their tune as as it seems fit. Um, so I think the right is and the right and the left are evil in different ways. The right is incoherent and inconsistent, and um, the left is uh, hypocritical and dishonest and soft, co- communist, so- socialist, uh, totalitarian. And at the same time, yeah, they're kind of both totalitarian. What you know, I've I've seen even uh, Justice Scalia recently. These people going back to the totalitarianism of them, they have this view, and I've seen Dick Durbin say it and many of them, that um, rights are not inalienable. Rights are not absolute. You know, these, well, nobody's rights are absolute. We have to have limits and whatever. Why, could you speak to that? What What are these, you know, in, in the Declaration of Independence, they talked about inalienable rights, unalienable rights, and... Today, our masters say, oh, no, 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 no rights are inalienable. No right. No rights are absolute. Are they correct? Yes. Who was correct? Well, Jefferson or Durbin? So anytime you have any employee of a government saying that rights are not absolute, I would say hold on to your wallet because they're coming after it. <laughs> In other words, it's just an excuse to justify taking people's rights away. So they want your property, and they don't want you to have a good argument against them taking it. So they, they, they find a way to impugn your ownership claim over your property, and their way is to say rights aren't absolute, right? Therefore, you can't really complain if we take a little bit of your property under taxes or on eminent domain law or whatever. Okay. Yep. So, um, so I would be skeptical of their motivation. Um, I mean, listen, this this is the common tactic you will see employed by people um, um, all over the political spectrum outside of libertarianism. What they will say is, and you will hear a liberal or a conservative, they will say exactly what I'm about to say. They'll say the following. We, we value liberty. We respect liberty. Liberty is an important value. But unlike libertarians, for us, it's just one of many values. We don't make it an absolute value. So we value other things, too. We value equality or a moral, you know, on behalf of liberals or leftists. Or the conservative will say, we also value a moral society where people – don't watch pornography or whatever, or smoke drugs. So we have, unlike you libertarians, you only value one thing in your whole lives. All you care about is liberty, which, by the way, is a straw man, and, and it's nonsense. Um, all you care about is liberty. That's why you're not willing to tolerate aggression. Well, we believe in liberty, but we believe in A, B, C, D, E, F, and G values, too. And because we believe in these other values, and because we're not so monomaniacal and we don't elevate liberty to be the only value we care about, we have to balance all these values. So we value liberty, but we also value personal integrity and self-sovereignty and egalitarianism and the environment. And we also value um, um, uh, uh, you know, a moral society. So we have to balance these values out. So when, when the government wants to pass a law, we have to decide you know, we have to balance these values out. And so what that always means in practice is that we um, – five minutes. What that means is we have to let liberty be sacrificed in some cases for the sake of these other values. 
this is what these guys do. Um, and so um, this is the fundamental problem I have with liberals and conservatives is that they, 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 they pretend like they value liberty, but they're not as simplistic like us libertarian rubes. And so they, they, they take other values into account, which means – come on, even, which means basically it's the make-weight argument for committing aggression. So it all comes down to a given law that commits aggression against someone, and they're basically in favor of it. And their reasoning is that you can't have absolute values against aggression, which basically means they're really not against aggression. <laughs> well, we libertarians, guess what? Or against aggression. Um, now, you can disagree with us on that, but let's not muddy the issues. Let's not confuse the issues. Let's not deny what the difference is. The difference is that we are opposed to aggression, and they are not. And you will notice that when you talk to these kinds of people, what they will say is they will start trying to engage in what I call equivocation, which is they will use um, they will they will use definitions and semantics to change the topic. They will say, um, well, we're against aggression, but not you're, even you're not against aggression all the time because you're, you're in favor of, of using force to stop, an, to stop someone who's attacking you. So then they will equivocate, and they'll, they'll say that if you are using self-defense, they call that aggression too. Now, I think they know better because they're not that stupid, but that's what they will do. So they'll say, well, I thought you were a libertarian. I thought you said you were against aggression, but yet you're against, you're in favor of using force to protect your right. Isn't that aggression? Absolutely not. <laughs> and it seems like the big hype placed lately in the last 12 years is um, safety, you tramples liberty anytime. Yep. Yeah. I think he moved into like a dead spot on his phone. Oh, we might have lost Stefan. Sorry. I'm oh, are back, you there? Guys. I, I had a Bluetooth problem. Sorry. Oh, I'm no back. problem. If you need to go, I totally understand. You've been with us way longer than I expected to hope to have you for. And I know yeah, you've got gotta things go, to go. I've got to go about three or four minutes, but uh, we, we, can, we can wrap it up. Let's wrap it up. Okay. I've got, uh, I got some things i I got I to gotta, I gotta wind up for. Yeah, and don't forget to uh, let us know how to um, check you out on the on the Internet and, and what you got going on so people can look into your work more, please. Um, yeah, my my, uh, my writing is all available at my website, stephankinsella.com, um, and that links to everything I've got. So that's just stephankinsella.com. It's fine. That's uh, And if people know it's Stephan, like S-T-E-P-H-E-N-K-I-N-S-E-L-L-A, please it's check P-H- it out. It's P-H-A-N, actually. But, A-N? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Yep. I should look at my phone because that's what it says. P H A. Yeah, well, I, I get that all the time. That's that's even actually, to be honest. But uh, I think either one of them will find me on the internet. And also, you can check uh, Stefan out with um, "Love Your Liberty" talk. You're uh, with uh, a friend of the show, Jeffrey Tucker. I love it when you guys get together and have your discussions. It's fantastic. You guys yeah, are I think we're right. Gonna, I think we're I think we're going to do one next week. So. Uh, on, on, we're going to do one on whether Bitcoin is a property right. Oh, that'll be good. That will be fantastic. All righty, Mr. Kinsella, thank you very much for joining us. Um, was a very was a pleasure. You're very amazing and awesome. I recommend people check out your work, buy his books, support this guy. He's got just oodles of information. It will make your life a lot better. I enjoyed it, guys, and I hope to uh, see you in Alaska someday. Oh, right on. Come on up. <laughs> Thanks a lot, right. guys. Thank you. Have a good one. You too. Bye. All right, let's just hit that call and see if he's actually on there. Hello, you're on the air. Uh, hello, this is Ted. Hey, thanks for hanging on. Yeah, uh, uh, yeah, that was uh, good. Uh, would you repeat uh, the last part of the fellow that talked, uh, spelling of his name? Yes, it's K I N. S E L L A. Canella. Kinsella. Kinsella. K I N S E L L A. Okay, great, thanks. Uh, say, uh, uh, I don't know, I haven't heard anybody uh, speaking about Operation Spring here in uh, Washington on May 16th uh, with Colonel Harry O'Reilly, Harry Riley. Oh, fill us in. I don't know about that. Uh, well, he's wanting to get 30 million people there. 
you won't see anything about it on the news, but it's, uh, it, it is on the Internet. And, uh, you know, he's calling for, you know, all races, everybody to go there to take the government back. Hmm. And they're going to occupy it. And they say they're going to stay until something's done. So, uh, but, uh, yeah, that's going to be a big deal. What's it called again? Operation Spring, Colonel Harry Riley. Hmm. Okay. And, uh, yeah, I mean, there's the Oath Keepers, uh, the Sheriff's Oath Keepers, all, just all sorts of people are going to be there. And uh, with the, you know, try and take back, try and put some new brakes on the car here because we're, we're going over the cliff. <laughs> yeah, the train has derailed. Yeah, and, uh, uh, I mean, we, you know, these people are recognized something's got to be done and they're doing it and uh, it, it, I recommend people check it out and see what's going on because you won't see anything on our on our communist news network oh absolutely not no they uh there is not much of freedom of the press anymore they're uh, co-opted by the state if you want to get your news if you want to know what's going on get on the internet while well, you can yeah <laughs> good point <laughs> while you can uh, and uh, uh it's uh, I support you guys. Uh, uh, I wish. Uh, do you have any uh, way of getting donations or? No, we or, don't. Well, that's that's okay. But uh, uh, I'm glad you're there to help get the word out. Thank you very much. Appreciate you uh, listening in and supporting. That's uh, that's what it's all about: getting the word out and making it happen. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it, the more we can educate ourselves, the better off we're going to be, guaranteed. Yeah, unfortunately, the more you know, the sadder you get. <laughs> yeah, there, there's a point to that. But, uh, you know, if you listen to Lou Rockwell, he had a podcast this week, and and he says, you know, he's short-term pessimist or something like that. But long-term, he's very optimistic because he sees, you know, short-term, the state's going to get bad or Maybe, you know, if the dollar collapses, it's not going to be good. But long term, he's very optimistic. And he's been in the game for a long time. If he's optimistic, I think there's good reason to be optimistic. We have to stay optimistic. We have children and posterity to think about. And we can't uh, let ourselves be have uh, the bad stuff destroy us. Well, you guys are letting people know there is a problem. And, you know, I mean, it's a bummer to know there's a problem and you got to fix something. But once you get it fixed, you're much happier. Yep. That's a fact. I'll let somebody else get on. Thank you very much. And hello, you're on the air. Hey, how's it going? This is Matt. Matt, how are you doing today? Oh, pretty good. How are you doing? We're having fun. <clears throat> yeah, I've been listening to you guys all morning. Boy, there's so much information there with your last uh, caller there and everything. A uh, lot, lot of good points there. Um, I think I hate the idea of... You know, it just seems like with even with all the legislation, you know, it, it can just go a few years and all they seem to do without even a change of a law or anything, they can just change the interpretation. Yeah. It's like, I mean, give them a dictionary or something, you know. <laughs> I, I, I don't know how they can do that all the time. Well, that was one of the points Mr. Kinsella was making of how, you know, they pass a law, then basically it's up to whoever's interpreting the words in that law of, of how it's going to be enforced. And then, like I brought up, brought up with uh, Scalia and Ginsburg, they had this, uh, I don't know, question and answer thing, and um, they both said... Both of these people, and Ginsburg's, you know, the leftist on there, and then Scalia's the supposedly the good constitutionalist on the right, and both of them said, well, none of your rights are absolute. None of these yeah. rights mean, basically, none of your rights mean jack crap to us. Because if they're not absolute, what are they? They're nothing. If they don't, you know, Jefferson said that your rights stop when you infringe on someone else's rights. But up to that point, you have the right to do what you want to do. Right. And then Scalia and Ginsburg, they say, nah, screw that. Yeah. And, you know, I don't really think that even if we didn't have uh, all the, the state and everything, you know, I don't believe that uh, Russia or China probably would not nuke us. They would rather take us whole. I mean... <laughs> If they if they nuke the land, they got to wait years before they can come in. Yeah, you know, and I know that the Soviet Union wants Alaska. Yeah, well, you, sir, we're we're coming at the end of the show here, so we got. I'm sorry, I got to cut you off there. And oh yeah, no problem. Thanks for the call. Yep, bye. You guys were listening to uh, Patriots and Men on 660 KFAR. What was that, Bob? 
So give them your info. Yeah. How do you, how do you find them on Facebook? I couldn't find you. Yeah. Well, you suppose you can go to Facebook, uh, Patriots and Men on Facebook, yeah, and it's just my stupid smart. Bam! Thing. It'll come up, and uh, mm-hmm. you can email us at patriotslament at gmail dot com, or the blog is patriotslament dot blogspot dot com, and we try to write as much as possible on there and link to good links. Actually, you can go to Patriots Lament and uh, I'll put a link up to Stephen Kinsella's website right there, which will make it easy for you to find them. Now, what about YouTube? I heard YouTube? We have a YouTube channel, which is Radio Free Fairbanks. Come on. Now, is that all linked together? Yeah. You can get to the website from there or you can go to the website and get to the YouTube channel. What about your guess? The wonders of technology. Claudio, do you got a website? No, I don't. You don't? No. www.brazil.com. <laughs> Anyways, how much time we got there? Uh, looks like you got about a minute. A minute? Well, we appreciate everyone listening and uh, definitely appreciate Steph and Kinsella joining us today. The guy is wonderful. I can't express enough that uh, if you want to know more about these ideas that we talk about that you should really check him out because he has he writes extremely well he's in- extremely intelligent he has a real job he is a lawyer um, check out his book against intellectual property you can get it for free you can download it for free and it'll uh, open your mind quite a bit on the whole IP and copyright and patent or check out uh, the YouTube video, Copying is Not Theft. It's a cartoon, and it's pretty funny, but it makes a very good point. And you can find that on patriotsmint.blogspot.com, too. Nice. Yeah, I couldn't even find you on Facebook. <laughs> maybe, I just, maybe it's my phone. Fairbanks is listening. Talk radio for the interior. 660 AM. KFAR. Fairbanks. Fox News Radio, I'm Paul Stevens. Malaysia welcoming a U.S. president for the first time in nearly 50 years. President Obama honored at a state dinner in Kuala Lumpur today in the third leg of a four-country trip through Asia, and he cited common.